Hello and welcome to SimScale. In this video tutorial, we will perform a non-linear analysis of a wheel. The objective of the simulation will be to analyze the deformation and stress distribution across the wheel while it's in operation. This tutorial teaches how to set up and run a static non-linear structural analysis, assign physical contacts, hyperelastic materials and boundary conditions with varying loads, mesh using the standard algorithm in SimScale, and finally, explore SimScale's online post processor to analyze the results. There are two links in the description. One allows you to import the project and perform the tutorial, while the other one is a documentation link where all the steps are described in detail. All right then, let's begin. In front of you is the SimScale workbench with the CAD model of a wheel. The wheel consists of a tire, a rim, and a flat body acting as a ground. If you observe carefully, the wheel is symmetric in two planes. If you refer to the orientation cube, you can see that the wheel is symmetric in the XZ plane and the YZ plane. We'll leverage this double symmetry to save on computational expenses and also prevent any displacements in these planes. To take a look at the symmetric model, go to the wheel quarter geometry from the geometries tree. And here you can observe the cuts that are made in the XZ and YZ planes. Okay, time to create simulation. Our analysis involves loads that are assumed to be applied very slowly, such that there are no inertia or damping effects involved. This calls for a static simulation. However, if you are interested in a time-dependent analysis, go to Dynamic. Create simulation. This opens up a simulation tree. This is nothing but the simulation setup. You need to make sure that each node in this tree has a green check mark before you can begin the simulation run. All right then, let's begin the setup. Click on the analysis type and on the right hand side appears global settings. Our analysis involves non-linearities such as physical contact, hyperelastic materials and weighting loads. Therefore, the non-linear analysis toggle must be activated. A weighting load will be applied in the downward direction at the center of the rim. But before we do that, we need to define some contacts. The first one will be between the rim and the tire. We will define this as a linear contact. SimScale automatically does this job for you. If you go to contacts, you will see that this linear contact has been defined as a bonded contact. Bonded contact definitions are used when there is no relative displacement between two connected solid bodies. So this type of contact constraint is used to glue together different parts of an assembly. However, we expect to see large deformations between this part of tire and this ground face. Hence, this contact needs to be designed as a nonlinear physical contact. To do that, go to physical contacts and assign a master assignment and a slave assignment. So the master assignment will be this face of the ground. And for slave, we will assign this face of tire. But why not the other way around? How does one decide between a master and a slave face? Well, slave tends to be more refined in mesh, fits within the outline of the master and expects large curvature deformations. So these three possibilities tend to fit in well with our this face of tire. Save the settings. And let's go to assign some materials. Starting with ground, our ground is made up of concrete. So from this material library, select concrete and apply. Assign ground and keep the properties as default. 
Next in the list is RIM. Our RIM is made up of polypropylene, which appears in the material library as PP. Assign RIM and keep the properties as default. Finally, it's time to assign a material to tire. Our tire is made up of rubber. So go to materials and select rubber. Click apply. And now is the interesting part. Our tire behaves as a hyperelastic material. So change material behavior to hyperelastic and make sure that our hyperelastic model is Mooney Rivlin. You need to define some coefficients. These are as follows. These coefficients that we just entered are obtained from curve fitting on stress versus strain curves for hyperelastic materials. Save the settings. Now is the time to assign some boundary conditions. Starting with ground again. Since our ground acts as a fixed support, select fixed support from boundary conditions and assign it to the ground. Make sure that you are into the volume mode before doing that. Save. Next, we need to take care of the symmetry involved. So go to boundary conditions again and select fixed value boundary condition. Now, how does this work? In the YZ plane, there are five faces which exhibit symmetry. One, two, three, four, and five. Now, we don't expect to see any displacement across the YZ plane, that is, in the X axis. Hence, we can set the displacement in the X direction to zero, while dy and dz can remain as unconstrained. Let's rename this as symmetry x for better understanding. Follow similar procedure for symmetry in the xz plane. Select fixed value boundary condition again. This time, our faces of symmetry are 1 and 2. And we don't expect displacement in the y-axis. So let dy be 0 and dx and dz can remain unconstrained. Rename this as symmetry y. Next, for the operating load supported by the wheel, Select a force boundary condition and assign it to the central faces of the rim. To enter the varying load, click on this icon and make sure it's time based. Now enter the following values in the table. Now, what does this mean? 
notice that our load starts at t equal to 0, gets maximum at t equals to 0.5, while reaches its mean value at t equal to 1. Now you might question why time is involved when this is not a time dependent analysis. Well, this is a pseudo static simulation. The time units expressed are in seconds, but they actually do not have any physical meaning. It just indicates that it's a sequence of events. There are no velocity or acceleration effects taken into account. So all the phenomena happening are assumed to be very, very slow. All right, we are done applying boundary conditions. Now let's go to numerics and simulation control. Here you can define the solvers and schemes and algorithms that are responsible for the simulation. You can leave them as default because they are good enough to solve this case. In most cases, you don't have to change these settings as these are carefully defined with respect to each case. Under simulation control, you can define time steps and simulation intervals and some other parameters. Our simulation interval is already from 0 to 1, so we don't have to make any changes. Keep them as default. Now is the time to mesh our geometry. SimScale uses standard algorithm to perform the mesh. We'll keep the sizing to be automatic, but our fineness will be maximum. Our elements will be first order, while number of processors, you can leave them to automatic. Please refer to our documentation on standard measure where you can get to know each parameter in detail. Save the mesh, but don't generate it yet. Now it's time to run the simulation. Go to simulation runs. This will open up a dialog box with an estimation of resources that will be consumed. Let's start the simulation. Our mesh will be computed first, followed by the simulation. The job status item below the simulation tree updates the status of the run. The simulation takes around 20 to 30 minutes to complete. While the simulation is running, you always have access to the solver log. Here, the output of the actual computing algorithm is displayed. Now let's have a look at the mesh. Our mesh is completely comprised of tetrahedral elements. You can go to the event log to look at the details. This includes the number of nodes, edges, faces, tetrahedral elements, and so on. Don't forget that you always have access to the meshing log and mesh quality where you can dig into the details a bit more. Now let's access the post processor. Go to your run and click on post process results. This takes you to the SimScale's online post processor. Let's analyze the results. In this analysis, we are most interested in the stresses developed. So make sure your parts are colored according to one Mrs. stress. And if you right click on the legend, make sure you use a continuous scale. Now from our boundary conditions, if you remember, our load was maximum at t equals to 0.5 seconds. So let's enter that here. And now you can see the stresses developed. The maximum stress is 40.46 megapascals and that probably occurs in this region. You can always use the inspect point feature and click on the desired locations within the geometry to check the stresses involved. Now another interesting thing is the actual displacement. To visualize the actual displacement, change coloring to displacement, magnitude, 
and add a filter displacement now if you observe the part of the tire in contact with the ground you can see that it has undergone some deformation the displacement magnitude is shown in the legend and can be switched to mm for easier understanding and the maximum displacement magnitude is of 9.79 millimeters and it probably occurs somewhere in this region now you can play with this it will be interesting to see the stresses develop and the deformation happening at the same time so go to parts color change the coloring back to von Mises stress and add a filter where we will like to create some animation let's play it so you can see the stress is developed and the deformation at the same time This brings us to the end of the session. I hope you really enjoyed it and learned something valuable. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section. See you next time.